Hi, everybody, and welcome to Illinois Humanities latest installation of the Envisioning Justice Rapid Response Series. This rapid response is called Replace, and that is re colon place because it's regarding place and it's also about the topic of replacing um, parts of the city. I'm Becky Amato. I'm the director of teaching and learning at Illinois Humanities and the co-teacher for this course, Justice in the City, which was part of the Odyssey Project's um, academic year 2020-2021 and was accredited through University of Illinois Chicago for the very first time this year. So we're very excited. Illinois Humanities is the state affiliate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. And our mission at uh, Illinois Humanities is to strengthen the social, political, and economic fabric of Illinois through constructive conversation and community engagement just like this. In case you don't know about the Odyssey Project, um, which I direct, um, it is, along with Envisioning Justice, one of the core programs of Illinois Humanities. It's a free college credit bearing humanities program for income eligible adults who have limited or no access to higher education. And just so you know, Odyssey is currently accepting applications for the upcoming academic year, which will start in late August. And um, we're really excited to bring in a new group of exciting and interesting students. Um, so I will be sharing information about how to apply at the end of this program. Good evening, I'm Christoph Ringer and I'm the co-teacher for Justice in the City. And tonight we are excited about collaborating with Envisioning Justice, a project that engages people throughout Illinois about the impact of mass incarceration through the arts and the humanities and more importantly, to develop strategies to create a just society. So our entire uh, course has been focused on this question. What does a just society look like? And how do we understand the profound forces that shape injustice in the city? And so really, really excited about sharing with you some of the insights that our students have come up with. Yeah. In this course, we really wanted to think about Chicago's spaces and places, mm -hmm. who shaped them, how they're being shaped now. We wanted to think about Chicago um, through the issues of power and rights and justice and the ways that all of those things shape our interactions with the city around us. And in addition to understanding Chicago's deep social injustices and inequalities, we also know that our city is home to a wide variety of social movements and profound individuals who have de dedicated their life to the pursuit of social justice. Definitely. Um, and so before we share some of the incredible uh, personal experiences of our students, we wanted to give you a little bit of context, maybe a little taste of what our course was like. So I'm gonna um, share with you a little montage of some of the maps that we looked at over the course of the semester with a little bit of a narration, just so you can see what we're thinking about when we're thinking about shaping the city and who shapes it. And then we'll go into the personal stories of our students. So join us. We begin with the early grid of Chicago. Platting or measuring and mapping out land is one way in which settlers transformed land into property and redefined what kinds of people could occupy the spaces of Chicago. This map shows population density in the growing city, but perhaps not surprisingly, it does not count the native peoples whose existence on the land was increasingly precarious by the 20th century. By 1895, the city was expanding and also growing more dense. Hull House Maps and Papers, which was published that year, exposed readers not only to the poverty and overcrowding that was plaguing the near west side of the city where UIC is today, but also to the demographic transformation that would fuel Chicago's industrial dominance. Second generation immigrants from Ireland, Germany, and Scandinavia lived side by side with first generation immigrants from Greece, Italy, Russia, and Poland. African American migrants from the American South could also be counted among the near west side's residents. A close look at these maps reveals how interconnected people from different parts of the world were to one another, and also how exploited and desperate they were in a city with few protections for workers. 
By the 1930s, the Federal Home Owners Loan Corporation was mapping the city for a different purpose, using data collected and reported by local real estate professionals, not social workers, as in the case of Hull House maps and papers. Staffers at the Home Owners Loan Corporation assigned grades and colors to residential neighborhoods that reflected their mortgage security. Neighborhoods labeled A and colored green on the maps were deemed safe investments for banks and other mortgage lenders. Those receiving the lowest grade of D, colored red, were considered hazardous. These grades and colors also reflected American racial hierarchy. A grades were assigned to white affluent neighborhoods, while D grades or redlined areas were assigned to working class, mixed ethnicity and black neighborhoods. Mid 20th century redlining brought decades of disinvestment to Chicago and other cities in the US. And despite being outlawed in the 1970s, it still exists in mildly reinvented form. Between 2012 and 2018, 168,859 loans totaling $57.4 billion were made in Chicago for residential properties. 68.1% of that money for housing purchases went to majority white neighborhoods, while just 8.1% went to majority black neighborhoods and 8.7% went to majority Latino neighborhoods. When the major lending banks in Chicago were invited this winter to the city council to explain these lending discrepancies, only one bank agreed to show up. Injustice doesn't happen at the level of individual home ownership though. It's a vast system of unequal resource distribution that includes dispossession of existing resources as well. One way that happens is through gentrification. The Urban Displacement Project at University of California, Berkeley teamed up with DePaul University, Elevated Chicago, and Strong, Prosperous, and Resilient Communities Challenge to assess gentrification risks for Chicago area residents. They found that 42% of Chicago neighborhoods had experienced a rapid increase in housing costs between 2000 and 2017, and 22% of lower income neighborhoods in Chicago were at risk of gentrification. As all of this tells us that we have a long way to go when it comes to achieving justice for the spaces and places of Chicago. In November 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered a rousing lecture on the radio. He reminded his listeners something that we need to remember today. The dispossessed of this nation, the poor, both white and Negro, live in a cruelly unjust society. They must organize a revolution against the injustice, not against the lives of the persons who are their fellow citizens, but against the structures through which the society is refusing to take means which have been called for and which are at hand to lift the load of poverty. This is our class's contribution to organizing that revolution against injustice. So our first video is from Myra Ortiz and Wanda Obazi and it couldn't be more timelier. One of the things we focused on in this course is how social injustices reproduce themselves over time. And what's important about this is we can look back historically and see when concrete decisions were made. And that way we realize that some of the things that we're suffering from were not inevitable. Other choices could have been made. Exactly. And these closings that you'll hear about from Myra and Wanda had disproportionate effects on different communities. This video that you're about to see really gives us a first person account by people who actually understand and lived through the significance of loss. So let's take a look. This is a place where King Elementary School once stood. It now serves as Chicago's most Instagrammable alley. An ode to my favorite donut, the Super Donut, by Mayra Ortiz. Remember the exciting sound of laughter and commotion from your friends running and chasing each other on the school playground? Racing to the lunchroom with your friends, hoping you make it on time to grab a warm Super Donut and apple juice. Being on the playground with your friends, Chirima, Suli, Rowan, and arguing about who's next in line to read Wrinkle in Time. Do you remember our science teacher, Mr. Elliot, teaching us about Pangea in fourth grade and being amazed? 
so amazed that we decided to draw the world out in the school playroom with chalk. When my dog, Pinky, got hit by a car, the next day my classmates tried to console me by making me laugh and offering me treats. Mr. Neely, our gym teacher, always wearing his mustard colored King elementary school shirt and blue sweats. We would always tease him when he wore shorts because he had chicken legs. He would gladly join us when we would ask him to play with us during our gym time. He loved his job. Whenever you visited his office, you will walk into Narnia. It was full of mysterious gadgets. They all had a story, and he would tell you those stories if you asked. Miss Sandifer, our librarian. She was my favorite person in the world. She was tall, serious, and so groovy. I would go to the library almost every day. The library was my sanctuary. I also think I was her favorite student. Miss Sandifer showed me the most wonderful books. Those books helped me shape the teenager I was going to become. We watch, we watch as, as bystanders in sadness, sadness as, memories as our replaced. memories are replaced. Was, was the replacement, replacement inevitable? inevitable? A just place shouldn't just exist place in a memory. Exist in a memory. Starting in 2002, for almost a 17-year period, nearly the time it takes to educate a child, Chicago closed 200 schools that educated mostly Black and Brown children. This is a generation of school closings. Attendance is mandatory and non-optional for children ages 17 and below. If a child fails to show up to class for several days in a row, they may be considered truant. What happens when an entire city fails to show up for the black and brown child's education? Cited from WBEZ 91.5 Chicago, a generation of school closings, published December 3rd, 2018. This is a poem by Wanda Obazi inspired by justice in the city and a generation of school closings. I attended Crispus Attucks Elementary School on 3813 South Dearborn Street from kindergarten through the eighth grade. It was closed in 2008. It's been boarded up and abandoned for the past 13 years. This is a PSA. The spirit of my childhood will not be easily erased. The ghosts of so many children still hunt this place. This is a hollowed failure, a testament of a city not at its best. This is a graveyard and memories never laid to rest. The totality of it all puts us in a negative because now there really are no children here. This is what happens to a dream deferred, food deserts and schools deserted. Little minds can't learn because nothing can be heard over growls from empty stomachs. The past holds the echoes of kids' laughter. The soul knows the pitter patter of the games we played. The times and memories we quote like scriptures in our minds like pictures that haven't yet begun to fade. For me, my past is full of locked doors of all the beautiful things that used to be. I've been waiting my adult life for them to autocorrect and make things right. But all I have left stands empty from a childhood stolen like a thief in the night. The future is born unaware and unafraid. It will endure from the same old mistakes made because history repeats on this city street. Many sad stories have been told. I want you to know it wasn't always a place full of death, sadness, and fear. Love played here, love lived here. This is not a celebration because there will be tears. This is not a declaration because they don't hear. This is not a plea for consolation because they don't care. This is a PSA. Yesterday, it was my school and my hood that closed down and just disappeared. Will your neighborhood be next? Will the doors that close next be yours? What a powerful message. And I really love this idea of a PSA, a public service announcement, that what happened to their communities could happen to anyone's communities. And one of the things I really appreciate about that project is that they answered the question, what does a just city look like not only in their own way, but in a very powerful way that a just city should not reside in a memory. So our communities already know what a just city looks like and feels like. Yeah, 
I'm really struck by the ways in which they expressed the experience of dispossession. Mm -hmm. And they're not really necessarily talking about the dispossession of property mm -hmm. or wealth. They're talking about the kinds of emotional wealth and identity that we developed develop um, in the places that we inhabit. Mm -hmm. And these are the places in which both Wanda and Myra grew up. And when you grow up in a place, your memories are lodged in that place to see it erased, to see it um, erased, left empty, and maybe rebuilt with something that's really not for you mm -hmm. um, is a kind of violence. Right, right. That uh, violence, I think, really comes up in the next piece that we're going to be talking about, which is Marietta, Marietta Evans's wonderful piece about Indigenous Chicago and the ways that we're beginning to acknowledge that history. Um, because that is the original dispossession and the original violence in this country and city. So I want to uh, read off a few of the names of the peoples who used to live in Chicago before we hear from Marietta. And this is from the um, American Indian Center and part of their land acknowledgement. Chicago is the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Odawa, the Ojibwe, and Potawatomi Nations. Many other tribes like the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Sac, and Fox also call this area home. So now we'll hear from Marietta. Hello, my name is Marietta Evans and I have had the pleasure of completing UIC's Odyssey Project 2021 Spring Alumni class called Justice in the City. Inspired by a first week's reading, I began to investigate the history of indigenous people in Northern Illinois. I wondered about the Portage Park neighborhood on the north side of the city. That's how I discovered the Northwest Portage Walking Museum and a proposed coil mound, indigenous art installation. The coil mound is slated to be installed at the southern end of Horner Park, bordered by Irving Park Road on the south. The Northwest Portage Walking Museum has been renamed the 4000 N Trail after organizers spoke to experts on how people actually traveled between the two rivers. It is a designated walkway that begins nine miles west, beginning with the Serpent Mound built in 2019 at the Schiller Park Woods Canoe Landing on the Des Plaines River. I chose this space because it represents an indigenous reclamation of space and history just a mile and a half east of my home in Albany Park. I believe that social invisibility is a basic tool for injustice in the city. Hence, this project can provide justice to an underserved community by bringing visibility to their physical history in the area, their experiences and culture. The Aquatic Ecosystem Reclamation Project report published by the Army Corps of Engineers recently restored and approved Corner Park's Western Riverbank. It was heartening to note that its stakeholder list included 12 Native American tribal organizations recognizing their historical and cultural importance to this watershed area. The Chicago Community Trust's Great Rivers mm -hmm. Grant Program funded the Coil Mound Project as it was proposed by the Chicago Public Art Group in conjunction with the American Indian Center and the Portage Park Neighborhood Association. Santiago X, an indigenous futurist artist, created the design for the Coyo Mound. As he said, this mound is trying to reinvigorate the indigenous landscape and is oriented towards giving indigenous people in this city a place to go, but not to be framed in history but giving us a place that is built by us and where we can celebrate our resilience. It is also designed to be an interactive educational experience. The Mound Project is supported by local government by being placed in its discretionary fund list. In 2020, $25,000 was allocated from the local alderman's discretionary funds to support the building and arrangements were made to set aside earth removed from the ecosystem restoration project for the mound's construction. 
Will the mound be used as a sledding hill, a playground, or a cyclist rest stop? The mound is not intended as a commercial asset for local real estate. This study of place required me to travel 350 years into the past, explore waterways, erosion, recreation, real estate values, and local politics. It introduced me to at least five distinct economic classes, the wealthy, well-employed, working, working poor, poor, and the homeless that live under the river bridges. I was most surprised at how just some certain government and community groups were, especially the Army Corps of Engineers, ecosystem improvement planners. It taught me the lesson on how powerful it is to build partnerships with like-minded community groups and how very important it is to stay on top of the earliest stages of proposed infrastructure changes. Before any contracts are signed, residents need to build coalitions and be able to provide feedback and approval from the grassroots level. Thank you. I'd like to end this with a poem. The belly of the mounded soil expands, exhaling its sweet breath. I inhale the coil of power surging up in the sole of my heels firmly grounded. My vision is sky bonded with the spirit arising from within Mother Earth. The way Marietta's project reminds us that social invisibility is a primary tool of oppression, uh, that if we don't have to think about or see entire populations and peoples, uh, it's so easy not to, uh, to understand uh, their oppression or to even acknowledge their oppression. And also, I really like the way in which Santiago's work helps us to rethink our relationship with land, right? To have a space that is not for commercial use, right? It kind of disrupts our ordinary way of thinking about space, especially as it relates to, to the city. Absolutely. And you know, one of the things that's really remarkable about the space that um, Marietta was investigating, not only its incredible history and the fact that the sculpture is being built there, but mm -hmm. it's such a beautiful space that seems somewhat untouched. Um, mm -hmm. And that can feel really rare in a city, uh, a city that really has tried to reinforce the natural environment that's there, the prairie, the river. Mm -hmm. So it's really a lovely site that she's chosen. I wanted to note that um, the music that was playing in Marietta's piece is Ojibwe music. So it's music that might have been performed here on this land within the last 400 years and certainly is being performed again today. Mm. And the other thing I wanted to note was how interesting it was that Marietta brought up the power of community partnerships, the power mm -hmm. of community. When communities can get together and find common cause, they really can create a, a movement mm -hmm. uh, where you didn't think there could be one. Now, it might have taken 400 years, uh, right. but we hopefully will have another 400 years to go, and maybe it doesn't have to be quite that long for the next major just change. Right. And so speaking of, of movements and uh, coalitions and communities uh, working together for a common cause, I think that's a really good point to introduce our next video, uh, which is from Sherry Harris and Karen Alvarez. And one of the things we've mentioned throughout the course uh, is that communities experience disinvestment in multiple ways. Right? And one of the ways in which communities experience that is through what we call food deserts. And Sherry and Karen's video really gives us, you know, what their uh, experience of food deserts has been over this past year. Let's go see it. Karen from Edgewater and I recorded our discussion via StoryCorps. We discussed the accessibility to fresh food and actual grocery stores in our areas. I currently live in West Garfield Park in an area that has an estimate 17,742 residents with an average of three residents per household. According to data by cmap.illinois.gov, I would venture to say 
There are definitely more residents in each household now due to the pandemic and loss of residents and having to bunk up, which is common in black and brown households. The scarcity of fresh food options is shameful. For example, in West Garfield Park, three blocks west of Madison and Pulaski, there is a Suedo grocery store, African Food and Liquors, located on the 4100 block of West Madison. It should read African Liquor and O oh, Food. The food is a secondary option as the majority of their sales are from liquor and tobacco products. Further east at Madison and Hamlin, there is an Aldi, one of the few big box retailers accessible to residents via public transportation. A walk, according to Google Maps, is 10 minutes at a normal pace. In my opinion, too far to travel on foot if you are a senior, have physical limitations, and have small children. Also, after 7 p.m., you are SOL. So, then you have to venture further west on Madison. There you have Leamington Foods, which is nearly two miles away, if you have to walk. Also, according to Google, it would take a total of 36 minutes there and back on foot with your groceries. When I lived in Edgewater, and I believe it's still the case, everything was close to where I lived. My elementary school was only one block away. Several grocery stores were nearby. My after school program just happened to be one minute walk away from my elementary school. There were several and still are several grocery stores that are vegan friendly, carry organic products. There is now a gym nearby and I think they have several great opportunities and very friendly people in the neighborhood. A dark road illuminated at the end by a fire we call home. Home is safe. Home is warm. Home is shelter. Home is a guide when you are in the dark. Home is beautiful when gentrification is willing to hold you in its arms. A dark road that you follow until you hit the wall called gentrification. Home is safe, as long as you don't go out after dark. Home is warm, if you can afford to pay the bills. Home is shelter, as long as you adhere by terms and agreements designed by those who refuse to live where you do. Home is not yours when gentrification comes knocking. Home is not home when you are pushed out by a wall you are not meant to climb. A wall that refuses to understand, embrace, or listen because you don't fit the description anymore. Well, I say rip the agreement. Tear down those walls, because life has handed you a home that others never meant for it to be yours. Their mistake was believing you would not fight for home. Home is beautiful, as long as you see the potential for change. Illuminate the dark with the fire in your soul. You are the rules. You are the terms and agreements. You are gentrification. Change is possible if it comes from you. I'm so amazed by this piece. It really demonstrates the ways in which where you live determines life outcomes, health outcomes, and access to the basic necessities of life. Right. Sherry does such a great job of showing the kinds of food resources that are in her neighborhood, and that's really, really limited mm -hmm. um, and just hard to get to fresh groceries. Right. And, then, and then you go to Edgewater, which is on the north side, where Karen's um, investigating the situation. And there you see Whole Foods. I mean, right. a massive, massive supermarket yeah. centrally located close to the L, mm -hmm. close to bus lines right on Broadway. And what's also interesting about Edgewater is there's a ton of different kinds of restaurants and cuisines for different kinds of diets. You can be a vegan, you can be gluten free, you can be dairy free, you could have organic only, you can have farm to table, locally produced, all of these different things. So the resources are really dense in that neighborhood and it, it changes how one feels about the place that they come from and feels about the general health of the neighborhood, mm -hmm. whether it's thriving or not. 
Right, right. You, you know, something, Becky, the other thing I appreciate about this video is that there's a really nice movement from the maps, right? And um, what we can know from maps, but then also the experiential knowledge, right? That, um, you know, people bunking up and things that you can't get from the map. And so it's a wonderful kind of integration of the knowledge you gain from the lived experience of a place and how it's represented on a map. And I think that was really a strength of the project. Yeah, thank you for saying that. That mm -hmm. is really striking. Um, so the next piece that we're gonna look at uh, kind of captures something really similar to something you might have seen in the Edgewater scenes from this past piece, which is the idea of gentrification and what it might look like. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna be looking at a piece about Hyde Park um, that is beautifully shot and narrated by Nicole Bond and Alicia Williams. And this piece shows us a little bit of one of two people's memories of the place and how it changes over time. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really excited to watch this and to share it with our audience. The format has changed. My neighborhood used to be 70s top 40 with a splash of jazz. Streets once buzzed with haunting bohemian melodies. The spirit of progress, its heartbeat, a mix. Races, backgrounds, incomes comprised the lyric. College town energy made you feel anything, everything was possible. Walking along the gentle, crime-free hubbub of 53rd Street best-selling hardcover books stood proudly on tables upright, spines unbroken at Crocs and Brentanos. The same books shelved together with lesser-known titles, all with spines broken and pages turned frequently, lived a few blocks south, up the street, down the stairs, where membership patrons sat for hours just reading not drinking cappuccino or listening to music or talking on cell phones, just reading. Wise men played chess in Harper Square. The grocery store was cooperative. Organic frozen yogurt and fresh vegetables juiced in tiny black box storefronts decades before we knew what organic really was and long, long before yogurt froze on every corner or juices jumbled. Africa had windows, artifacts, and artwork from the mainland for purchasing or just perusing. Dr. Wax had tracks and tracks of vinyl. There was a newspaper stand on the corner and Big Jim Smoke Shop under the vinyl sold assorted hippie paraphernalia. Rice papers, hemp papers, papers with a wire running through so fingers would not burn when handmade cigarettes were smoked to their absolute ends. I see the train zipped above the viaduct. It was the way to really fly long before we called it Metro. Yellow, mellow, Crepes served on Sunday morning with fresh squeezed mimosas or beef bourguignon on Friday nights with Key Royales. Parakeets lived in the trees. Enormous green birds made their home hiding in the stellar regions of the park with the call and response of coal train tails. Sure, they squawked relentlessly and chewed the electrical wires and peppered cars with their droppings. But the mayor, the real mayor, the best mayor, the black mayor, the only mayor who lived across the street from the lawn they called home, liked them. So nobody messed with them. We all got the point. We all went to the point, the farthest point of land jutting out into the water, accessed by pedaling along the lakefront's edge or by strolling across the bridge arched overhead the lake shores drive. It was alive. Thump, thump, doo doo, doo, -doo. thump, thump, doo doo, doo, -doo. thump. But the format has changed. My neighborhood 
now is on AutoTunes. Pandora has opened her box. The big small town independent bank on the corner, once anchoring it all, has fallen by the way of other banks now merging with another bank. Even my statements look different each month. Not just the balances they report. Even the paper. Thinner. Flimsier. Lesser. The university, once lending its college town vibe, has become a greedy monster devouring all the land in its path. You do the math. North Shoreans, upside down in homes they couldn't afford to begin with, are flocking to my 70s. Top 40 with a splash of jazz village. They've turned it into a techno-synthesized diatribe with no soul. The record is scratched. Wow, that piece is so awesome. It's so magnificent. I feel like I was in a dark beatnik bar with a cigarette the whole time. <laughs> You were, you were in the tiki bar. Exactly. It felt that way. It definitely felt that way. If only I had my bongo drums uh, to, to play right now. Um, I really loved the aesthetic of that piece because it felt like I was going to Hyde Park in a different period of time. It's not the Hyde Park that I've ever known. And so I really appreciate the ways that Alicia and Nicole situated us in this memory space right. and then took us to the present one of the things that was really amazing to me was that in the images that they took of Hyde Park today, particularly at the end, the video that showed Starbucks and LA Fitness and the, the bank has turned into a major national, maybe international conglomerate and those huge metal buildings really enhances the feeling of anonymity and like you could really be anywhere. It's sort of the feeling we've all had about Zoom. Like we we aren't in a real space, we're in Zoom space. That's right. a different virtual space. And right. that's kind of what Hyde Park felt like in those videos. And I mean, some of those spaces were the same thing we saw in Edgewater. So mm -hmm. what that brings to mind is some of the things that we read about uh, urban sociology in the early 20th century in our class, Ernest Burgess and Robert Park and Lewis Wirth talking about the anonymity of the city and the ways in which people have a hard time building ties with each other. Mm -hmm. The fact that is that we've discovered together that we all know is that we do build ties with each other. We build these communities and the reasons that we feel disconnected are because of these dispossessions and displacements and violences. So, um, yeah. so what we need is something quite different than replacement, which is mm -hmm. kind of our theme, but maybe, maybe something different, maybe a reimagining of what a city, a just city could be. That's right, that's right. And I have to say this, you know, that video brought up so many memories. Uh, in addition to time that I spent at uh, Dr. Wax, uh, big shout out to Dixie's Kitchen, who used to have a wonderful catfish po' boy sandwich. Loved it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that it brought back so many memories. But one thing I really appreciated too was this metaphor of the dial, right? The change in format, because there is something about the loss of, let's say, a radio station that you used to listen to on a regular basis, right? There's something about uh, the loss of that experience that, that may really change kind of the texture of everyday life. And I think that was captured in a powerful way by that video, but also even just as important is the way in which the music and the poetry in the video is also very edifying, right? In other words, they've taken these images and memories, and not only have crafted a critique of the present, but it's precisely that kind of creativity uh, that will take us into the future. So I really think it was a, a wonderful way to, um, to really end all of the videos to say, the city that we want is possible. And so with that, I want to officially thank all of our students uh, for all of their hard work throughout the semester. Uh, the readings were challenging, our conversations were challenging, uh, and at times both of us recognized that some of the conversations were, uh, to put it frankly, depressing sometimes. 
when you're wrestling with injustice, but um, there's a lot of hard work put in. We thank everyone for attending uh, this evening, and we hope that you'll stay in touch uh, with uh, Envisioning Justice, the ISU Project, as well as Illinois Humanities. Definitely. Yeah, I fell completely in love with this class, so nobody's allowed to go away. We'll all be together in one room again sometime soon, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, I want to really, really thank the Envisioning Justice team, which includes Jane Beachy, Tyrese Williams, Meredith Naka, and new to the team, Alyssa Bierce, who uh, have really made this so much easier for us to produce together. They have built a framework that we could just plug ourselves into for rapid response. And it was such a joy to be able to do that and collaborate together. I also really want to thank Tony Santiago, without whom there would be no program. Uh, he put it all together. So thank you. Thank you, Tony. And I want to thank the uh, Illinois Humanities staff, the team, Jen Yu, Gabe Lyon, uh, Chris Gazaitis. I mean, there's so many people who've helped us get to this point. It's an incredible team of people. I have a couple of things I wanted to say before we, we say our goodbyes this evening. The first thing is that we've made some mention of different readings and things that we've talked about in class. And happily, we've had the chance to put together a resource page that's sort of derived from our syllabus and includes uh, downloadable readings from the course. So you'll be able to find that on the Illinois Humanities website. And I think in the chat, there will be a link popping up at some point if it hasn't already. And we can thank Tia Williams for, for making sure that happened. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, Odyssey is accepting applications for the next year. Um, and our deadline is June 1st. I am also going to pop some information into the chat, uh, if you haven't seen it already, about applying to Odyssey. Just want to mention we also have a uh, site that's in Spanish only. So if you speak Spanish, have friends who speak only Spanish, who, or who want to learn in Spanish, and discuss in Spanish, we have that program as well. So it's a very exciting year that we have ahead and closing out this really exciting year as well. So thank you all for joining us this evening and um, wishing you a, a wonderful evening. Thunderstorms and glaciers falling. We sound like patience in the morning. Wings of light mixed with heaven yawning. Glorious. Scream till we feel victorious. My sound teams with the style of the orderless. Poor profit on soapboxes. Free soul, but the voice had to unlock it. Uh, we disrupt and dismantle. We'll take a knee, motherfuck your anthem. We original, never needed a sample. My silence speaks as loud as these streets on fire. My feet don't tie. Even when I'm chasing the beat in my mind, let it peak in my spine. So I keep it aligned. All I need is the reason, the word, and the rhyme. Boom. Lost myself in the tune. Lost myself to your view. Lost myself to the coon, lost what I felt too soon, lost with all of these black bantu, African connections run through no matter if it's only y'all in the room, all greet a homie like ooh, I'm trying to get like you, we loud and we proud cause we full voice people, shout across mountains people, we full voice people, shout across mountains people.
Thank you.